Imagine moving to a new city or perhaps even another country. You probably want to rent a place for living. You probably want to get an electricity contract for that place. And maybe you even want to purchase a few household items online. Turns out you can't. Why? Because your creditworthiness is considered to be insufficient. Now you might be wondering, what is creditworthiness? It's a pretty long word for the English language, that's for sure. But jokes aside, creditworthiness is the estimation of the probability of default for future debts. When you apply for a loan with a bank, when you seek to enter into a contract with a telecommunication, insurance, or energy provider, sometimes when you want to rent a place or even when you buy stuff online, your creditworthiness is being checked. Because these companies offering their services to you have an interest in knowing on whether or not you're a reliable debtor. In other words, they want to know whether you're capable and willing to pay back whatever you're going to owe them. But how are they supposed to know? And this is where credit reference agencies come into play. Credit reference agencies are companies that use shady algorithms to calculate so-called credit scores, scores which are supposed to give information on your creditworthiness. And by doing so, credit reference agencies trample on the principles of European data protection law. And I should know, I'm a data protection lawyer and I used to work in one of these agencies. And behind the scenes, trust me, there's there's secrets that our democracy should not endure. Now, to begin with, you might be wondering how are credit reference agencies even capable of making such allegedly precise predictions on you being a reliable debtor? How do they make such a calculation? Well, there's a tiny fraction of people who might actually be bad debtors. People who consistently fail to pay their debts. People with debt collection agencies on their heels, and people who recently underwent insolvency proceedings. But according to some credit reference agencies' own statements, that concerns less than 10% of the general population. The rest of us, we pay our bills on time, and we're reliable contract partners, aren't we? And this is where it gets interesting. On these remaining 90% of the population, credit reference agencies do not have any data that is connected to past payment behavior. So what do they do? They use generic information, such as age, address, and gender, and use that by feeding it into their algorithm to calculate credit scores. Because statistically, or so the narrative goes, younger people are worse debtors than older people, Men are worse debtors than women, and people living in urban areas are worse debtors than their rural counterparts. Now, you might be wondering, how are credit reference agencies, even, how do they even get to that information? Again, a tiny fraction of people can be found online in public registries, such as commercial registries or registries of association, but that's only a small percentage of us. For the rest, there is no publicly available address data, for example. So what do credit reference agencies do? They do what any other company that wants to offer a good or service but can't do it on their own does. They cooperate. They cooperate and secretly buy millions of data sets behind our backs from address publishers. And address publishers, in turn, are companies that collect personal data for advertisement purposes, something very different from credit scoring. And to maybe put a perspective on the scale of this, in a pending court procedure in Austria, I've seen a contract where the address publisher guarantees to sell data on 7.3 million people living in Austria to a credit reference agency. That's the whole full-aged population of Austria, mind you. Now, all of this poses fundamental problems that our democratic societies cannot afford to ignore. First, the whole business of credit reference agencies is extremely opaque and systematically violates the law. European data protection law is governed by a row of principles. One of these principles is the principle of transparency. That means when your data is being collected, you need to be informed about this, especially if the data collection happens without your involvement. All of us, as we're here today, we're probably in the database of at least one major credit reference agency. 
Have we been inf informed about this? Probably not. So the principle of transparency is being ignored. Another principle of data protection law is purpose limitation. That means a credit reference agency cannot simply purchase data from an address publisher, data that this address publisher has been using for advertisement purposes, and use this data to do credit scoring. To lawfully process the data, the credit reference agency would need the individual's consent. And German data protection authorities have even emphasized the necessity of consent for processing data that is, has no connection to past payment behavior. Yet in practice, this is widely ignored. And it goes even further. European data protection law is very strict when it comes to algorithms making decisions that have a significantly negative impact on a person. For example, their economic situation, such as when you apply for a loan and it's denied. In these cases, human oversight and intervention must be foreseen. In reality, no such mechanisms are in place. And people are denied loans or even access to basic necessities simply because computer says no. So credit reference agency completely disregard the law and secretly collect all our data behind our backs, shove it into their algorithms, and calculate questionable scores with that. And that brings me to the next topic, the second issue. Despite the widespread use of these credit scores, credit reference agencies repeatedly refuse to provide any public proof that these scores actually work. Are you really a worse debtor just because you're in your 20s and not in your 50s? Just because you live in the wrong neighborhood or in the same building as someone with an actually bad payment history? There's a difference between the plausibility of these claims and the question of the statistical robustness. While an actual bad payment history might be a strong indicator for someone being an unreliable debtor, your age, address, and gender probably do not carry the same weight. So, and this is what always puzzles me about this, other companies that provide services of a certain societal relevance, such as banks, telecommunication provider, insurance companies, they are subject to strict rules that meticulously regulate their conduct. However, for credit reference agencies, there aren't really any laws in place that impose any quality standards on credit scores or that say which information are allowed to go in these scores and which not. So is it really justifiable to be denied a loan or maybe even something more benign like a phone contract just because a secret algorithm fed by secretly collected data says you shouldn't and the only ones understanding how this algorithm works is the credit reference agency itself? I don't think so. And this brings me to the third and final issue. All of this is prone to be terribly discriminatory. We know that immigration mostly happens in cities. We know it takes a while to get a foothold when moving to a new country. And people naturally gravitate towards areas where people of the same cultural background already reside. Now, assigning a bad creditworthiness to whole neighborhoods, to entire streets of houses, is the best recipe for cementing existing social inequalities. Whole demographics are in danger of being excluded access to basic necessities, or they might only be able to secure loans under worse conditions, that means with higher interest rates, than those people already living in the good areas. Now you might be thinking, all of this is pretty messed up. I'll just have my data deleted, as is my right under data protection law. And here is where it even gets worse. Because even if you manage to have your data deleted, credit reference agencies consider that a bad thing. They then treat you as an unknown person and automatically assign a suboptimal credit worthiness to you. So even managing to escape the clutches or having your data deleted might not help at all. What can you do, though? What can you do? You can ask. You have a right to know what data a credit reference agency has on you, where they have it from, and what scores they calculated based on, the, on that data and who they sold it to. But don't expect to be served that information on a silver plate. 
the credit reference agency will most likely withhold some information. They might even send an attorney's letter or two to make you back off using legalese, big legal words. Don't back off. Keep digging. Keep digging and you'll be surprised in a, in a very unpleasant manner on how much information credit reference agencies think they have on you just by connecting a few data points with sociodemographic information. But the more of us asks, the harder it gets for them to fly under the radar and to treat us like piles of data to make a profit with, rather than individuals with rights and freedoms. Because despite all I just told you today, on the bright side, there's a high chance for all of this to change for the better. There's a silver lining on the horizon. Pending cases before the Court of Justice of the European Union challenged the wild and uncontrolled data collection by credit reference agencies, as well as the unlawful automated decision making by their algorithms. And data protection NGOs have brought numerous complaints with European data protection authorities questioning the lawfulness of processing personal data with no connection to past payment behavior. And these cases are going well. But despite the, uh, these pending cases, public debate on the proper conduct of credit reference agencies remains scarce. Let's change that. Let's use the momentum from these cases and spark a debate on what credit reference agencies should and should not be allowed to do. In a democratic society, transparency, lawfulness, and the individual's rights and freedoms should always prevail over opaque and discriminatory practices. Practices which are quite likely to become even more invasive with the rise of ever more sophisticated artificial intelligence. And yes, we might be living in an information age. And yes, data is the oil of the 21st century. But our personal data is far more than that. It's far more than a merchandise to be shoved around in secret. It's part of who we are as individuals. So it's our call as a society to decide what should and should not happen with it and to decide which practices should be seized as intolerable. Because in the end, democracy should not succumb to surveillance capitalism, be it in the form of big tech tracking our every move online or credit reference agencies ranking us in secret.